All right, so I, I, I should probably get started. Uh, so let me thank the organizers for inviting me to come here and tell you about neutrino masses. Uh, so this is a plan of, of what I'll talk about uh, as Boris has advertised. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to go over very briefly the evidence that we have for neutrino masses not being zero. And I'll take advantage of the fact that he's already introduced the concept of neutrino oscillations just for me to show you very quickly how we know that neutrino masses are not zero. Then I will quickly uh, jump into uh, trying to uh, uh, define what it is we're trying to understand, at least from a theoretical point of view, and I'll try to convince you that neutrino masses are interesting. Okay? The biggest question that I will talk about is uh, what we really try to understand is uh, why are neutrino masses very small as opposed to not so small or zero? And that's the biggest challenge that we have. And uh, I'll mostly uh, uh, explain why that's an interesting question with lots of consequences uh, by discussing one example in, in detail. And depending on of how I do with time, I might make some comments about le lepton mixing as well. And then I'll, I'll conclude with a list of what's our wish list as far as learning more about neutrino masses, and then I'll conclude. <coughs> now, <coughs> this is something that I assume that many of you have already heard about, uh, and especially if you listen to Boris's talk. I do want to remind you of the fact that neutrino oscillations are a fact. There's no doubt that neutrinos can change flavor. Okay, and they do that as a function of the baseline, which is how long they've traveled, and as a function of the energy that they have. Now, the list of different types of experiments that I've seen confirmed neutrino oscillations is getting longer and longer. So, for example, we have evidence for neutrino neutrinos being detected as tau neutrinos when they're produced in the atmosphere. We have evidence for electron neutrinos produced in the sun being detected as muon or tau neutrinos when they get to the Earth. We have evidence for uh, electron antineutrinos produced at reactors disappearing on the way between the, 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 the production and the detector. Uh, we also have evidence for neutron neutrinos disappearing in between uh, an accelerator and a detector that's about 1,000 kilometers further away. And we also have uh, a little bit of evidence for neutron neutrinos being detected as an electron neutrino uh, when they get to the detector as well. So all of this evidence for neutrino flavor change which is sort of a beyond reasonable doubt at this point, can only be explained by neutrino masses and mixing, which is what Boris told you about. So let me go over some of this evidence uh, uh, very quickly just to give you a flavor of what's been going on. I should also mention that this uh, neutrino flavor change problem is a relatively old problem. The first time that we got evidence that maybe neutrinos were changing flavor probably happened in the 60s when people first started studying solar neutrinos. Uh, that was a problem that took a very long time to resolve, and, uh, and a very long time means, you know, more than 40 years or something like that. And then the next problem that occurred had to do with these atmospheric neutrinos. So what people can do and what they can measure is uh, there's cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere all the time. They produce pions, the pions decay. Those pions produce mostly muon neutrinos and muons. These muons then propagate, and every once in a while, a muon will also decay. So that means you get uh, both muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos that are being produced. Now, you can measure the neutrino flavor, for example. And in particular, one thing you can measure is you can look for pions that are produced uh, on top of you in the atmosphere on that side. And then you can measure that flux of muon neutrinos. We can also look at the muon neutrino flux that's being produced on the other side of the Earth. Okay. Now, curiously enough, because the neutrino cross-sections are so small, you can quickly convince yourself that for the same angle, the number of neutrinos you expect to get from above is the same as the number of neutrinos that you expect to get from below if you ignore the fact that the neutrinos can be absorbed very, very, very little. So it's a very good thing to ignore. So you expect this uh, upwards flux and the downward flux to be the same. So what experiments have determined starting in the very late 80s is that when you do this experiment, this ratio of the uh, upwards flux and the downward flux is more close to a half than it is to one. Okay? So this is evidence that neutrinos that travel a short distance, which is about 15 kilometers or so, and neutrinos that travel a long distance, like uh, 13,000 kilometers or so, uh, they behave differently. Now, the data that we have is much better than that. So this is a type of data that people have collected 
for example, the Super Kamiokande experiment, uh, these data are not the most up-to-date data, but they're very good data. And if you look at this, this is a measurement of the neutrino flux for different flavors. So this is electron flux, electron flux. This is the muon type of flux. What changes when you change from these different panels is the neutrino energy. So they have different bins that characterize the neutrino energies in different ways. And uh, the x-axis here is the cosine of the zenith angle of the muon that gets produced. So neutrinos that come from above have a cosine theta of 1, and neutrinos that come all the way to the Earth have a cosine theta of minus 1. The more interesting plot to look at is this plot over here. Okay, and you look at this a solid line here. The solid line tells you what you expect. Okay, so given everything that we know about the production of muon-type neutrinos in the atmosphere, including the fact that you can change the normalization and things like that, this is what you expect. And like I was advertising, the number of neutrinos from above and the number of neutrinos from below is expected to be the same. And the data are these points here. Okay, and you don't have to look at it for a very long time to figure out that the data are completely different from what you expect. Again, it's important to keep in mind that this is not a subtle, small effect. This is a very big effect. Okay, uh, so that's just, uh, step number one. And uh, what's exciting is, if you take uh, the formula that Paul has told you about, and you pretend that there are only two neutrinos, and you calculate what's the survival probability of muon neutrinos, it has an expression that looks like this. So there's a mixing angle, and then there's an oscillation phase. And you can get a really good fit to these data by picking the sine squared of 2 theta to be of order 1 and, to, and the delta m squared to be about 10 to the minus 3. Okay? And this is what happens in this panel over here. If you look at all of these other panels, what changes is the neutrino energy. And you remember that this formula goes like L over E. And you notice that in all of these different panels, the fit with this uh, dotted line fits the data really well in spite of the fact that the shapes are different because there is an energy dependency. So this is the most uh, uh, in-your-face oscillation data that we got uh, around 1998 from the Super Kamiokande experiment. This is basically what convinced everybody that this was going on. Now there's one comment which is kind of interesting to make at this point. Uh, what this picture is telling you is the fact that neutrinos that travel a little bit and neutrinos that travel a lot behave differently. Okay? This fact by itself is enough to convince you that neutrinos have mass. Okay? Because neutrinos that don't have mass, they don't know what it means to travel a little bit or what it means to travel a lot. If you don't have mass, you don't have a clock. Everything for you is instantaneous. If you do know about traveling distances, you must have a mass. It doesn't mean that neutrino oscillations have to be the answer. It could have been something else. But it would be very strong evidence for either neutrinos having a mass and doing something. Uh, one thing people like to talk about is that if you didn't know better, you could look at this picture and say, hey, maybe the neutrinos are decaying. Okay? And that turns out to be ruled out by the data. But if the neutrinos were decaying, they probably need to have a mass to begin with because they have to decay into something that's lighter than they are. So that's uh, an interesting thing to mention. Now, this uh, uh, phenomenon of the atmospheric neutrinos is confirmed by uh, other types of experiments uh, with accelerators. Uh, one of them is the Munoz experiment at Fermilab. What you do is you produce a pion beam out here at Fermilab. You let the pions decay. And then you shoot your neutrinos all the way across Wisconsin. And then you detect them in Minnesota. If you don't know anything about US geography, like me, then uh, I just want to tell you that this distance is about 730 kilometers, okay? Which is very impressive in its own right. You know, shooting a neutrino beam 730 kilometers uh, means, among other things, that your beam has to be pointed downwards a little bit, for example. Otherwise, the neutrinos wouldn't get there. They would just go to the air. So they do this experiment. They have a really big detector. And again, what they're built for is to look for this disappearance of muon-type neutrinos. And this is their data, or uh, uh, one, one of their data. The red line is what they expect for the number of uh, muon neutrinos as a function of energy. The, the points are the data points. And the blue line is uh, uh, the result of one oscillation fit. If you take the ratio of those two lines, this is what you get. 
So you get this pattern that at high energies, the neutrinos don't seem to be oscillating. And then you have some oscillation that starts to grow as the energy gets down. And this is very well explained by this two flavor formula that Boris told you about. In this case, for delta m squared, which is about 2.4 times 10 to the minus 3, and a mixing angle that's very close to sine squared 2 theta of 1. Okay? And one thing that we have a hint of is the fact that this almost starts to look like an oscillation as well, because you notice that they have this point here that tells you that perhaps something interesting is going on. Now, I want you to remind you of the fact that uh, this is a, the oscillation goes like sine squared of uh, delta m squared L over E. So if you plot things as a function of energy, you don't get a nice sine function, you get a distorted sine function. And to make matters uh, a little bit more complicated, this is also a log scale. So that's why this doesn't look like a sine function. But the fact that this can recover and come back up is what the oscillation is all about. Okay, let me now turn to the older problem that has to do with neutrinos, which has to do with solar neutrinos. Solar neutrinos are very interesting. Uh, <coughs> they were postulated as a very good way of trying to understand how the sun works. Okay, and it was figured out by different sets of people that, that the sun works by nuclear fusion, and I'm sure everybody has heard about that. And it turns out that for our sun, the, dom the dominant nuclear, fu nuclear fusion process that, that, that is happening is a PP fusion. So the sun is still a, a, a relatively young star that is still burning protons uh, uh, to make energy. And if you, this is the so-called PP chain that's going on in the sun. I notice that this is impossible to read from anywhere except maybe the first row, but you have to take my word for it. You start out with protons, uh, they fuse into deuterium, the deuterium eventually will fuse into helium-4, the helium-4 will also start fusing into other stuff, and you end up with other uh, uh, light metals like lithium and beryllium and boron. But what's interesting is in all of these fusion processes, this is a proton-rich environment, so all of these fusion processes will produce uh, neutrinos as well. Okay, and they always produce electron-type neutrinos as opposed to antineutrinos or as opposed to muon-type neutrinos or tau-type neutrinos. So the sun, it turns out, is a very effective neutrino factory. It produces a lot of neutrinos. And neutrinos are nice because they can just escape from the sun, and then there's a very robust flux of neutrinos coming out. So the challenge was to figure out what the flux of these neutrinos is, and then to measure them on the Earth, and then to figure out what's going on. Now, what happened was the first measurements of that told us that we made a prediction for the solar neutrino flux, and when we made the measurement of how many neutrinos we got, we got about a half to a third of those neutrinos were arriving here. So somehow, in between the Sun and the Earth, half of the neutrinos were missing. It's more like a third, but let's, let's keep it at a half. How did we figure out what happened there? What we did is we have lots of different kinds of experiments. I'm only going to talk about one, and then I'll mention the others in the next slide. And that's something called the SNOW experiment. That's an experiment in Canada that has concluded. It's taken all of its data. They have uh, emptied out the experiment, and they're going on and doing something else. But what this experiment was, this was a heavy water experiment. Okay, so that's a nuclei of uh, deuterium that you have available. And deuterium was interesting because in this kind of experiment, you can measure neutrinos in three different ways. And they found out a way of separating out these different ways. And uh, the first way you measure neutrinos is what's called a charge current reaction. And what you do is you have electron neutrinos, they come in, they hit uh, this deuterium here, they convert one of the, pro one of the neutrons into a proton, they convert the neutron into a proton, and then they, they emit an electron. So you take deuterium, you break it up into two protons, and then you have an electron, and what you measure is this electron here, okay? So that's your signal. The protons don't do anything that's useful. The other thing that can happen is that you can have elastic scattering. That's a neutrino coming in, hitting an electron, and then just elastically scattering. And again, you can measure this electron here. And fortunately, you can tell an electron from charge current processes from an electron from electron scattering because the kinematics were very different. Then the third process that they had access to in this experiment is the neutrino could come in and have a neutral current interaction with the deuterium and just break it into a proton and a neutron. 
And what that, what their detector could do is to determine that, it, to measure this neutron here, okay? So that means I have an experiment that can measure the solar neutrino flux in three different ways. What's even more important is the fact that depending on the flavor of the neutrino, uh, you will have different rates for these reactions here. Okay, so that's easy to see. The first one is if you look at the first line, only the electron neutrino can hit a neutron and convert it into a proton and an electron. The muon neutrino doesn't know how to do that because the muon neutrino has to produce a muon. And solar neutrino energies are not high enough for that. And the tau neutrino can only produce a tau, so they don't know how to do that either. Then you have this elastic scattering reaction here. All of the neutrinos know how to hit an electron, okay? Because this, again, is, a, is, a, is, is an elastic process. But what happens is the electron neutrino and the electron antineutrino, they can also talk to the electron via W boson exchange. So the cross-section for an electron neutrino hitting an electron is different from the cross-section for a muon neutrino hitting an electron. One number to keep in mind is for these types of energies here, uh, a muon neutrino, as far as uh, scattering on electrons is concerned, counts like 15% of an electron neutrino or so, okay? Because the cross-sections are different by about that amount. Finally, this last reaction here is a pure neutral current reaction. You're just breaking up deuterium. So for this reaction here, all of the neutrinos, E, mu, and tau, behave in exactly the same way. So this is what you did. So you can measure the flux of neutrino coming from the sun, and you can determine by measuring it in, the, in these different ways whether the neutrinos coming from the sun are only electron neutrinos, whether they're electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos, or you can even try to figure out if there are other, you know, sterile kind of neutrinos coming from the sun. The result is presented here, and what these axes are, this is a measurement of the electron neutrino flux, and this is a measurement of the muon and tau type neutrino fluxes coming from the sun. And here are these three different measurements that I told you about. So the charge current only measures the electron neutrino flux, the neutral current measures a one-to-one -one combination of those two fluxes, and this elastic scattering measures mostly the electron neutrino flux with a little bit of a tilt to it. And you notice that these three lines meet at a point, or at a band, because these are bands. <coughs> and you also notice that what's really important is that this snow experiment has very definitive evidence that somehow it seems like there are muon and tau-type neutrinos coming from the sun. Now, there's no reaction in the sun that can produce muon and tau-type neutrinos with these types of energies that we're talking about. In some sense, the sun is too cold for that. It doesn't know how to do that. So the only interpretation that we have for this is that in between the, the electron neutrinos being produced and the neutrinos getting to the Earth, the, electrons are, the electron neutrinos are turning into muon and tau-type neutrinos. This is very, very conclusive evidence that we have that this phenomenon is going on. Again, we can do a little bit better than that. We can measure the survival probability of electron-type neutrinos as a function of energy. And you get a curve that, if oscillations are correct, for these types of parameters here, sine squared theta of about 0.3, and a delta m squared a little bit less than 10 to the minus 4 electron volts squared, this is people about that later, but I'm not going to talk about this here at all. You just have to take my word for it. <coughs> Now the measurements are kind of here, so there's some very low energy solar neutrino experiments that have measured the flux at low energies. That number is about a half. And then there's things like the SNOW experiment and the SuperK experiment. They measure neutrino energies at the high end. And again, these are neutrino experiments. High end here means 10 MeV. And uh, you see that you get a very good agreement with the data in spite of the fact that the SNOW data seem to be curving downwards as opposed to curving upwards as the theory predicted, but the error bars were big enough that we're not too worried about this yet. Okay, and again, uh, uh, this is a very, very robust explanation for this phenomenon. Again, we have confirmed this in the laboratory as well. So there's an experiment called CAMLAND in Japan, and what they do is they try to monitor the neutrino flux, the electron, neutri electron antineutrino flux from nuclear reactors that are being produced everywhere in Japan, and we know about nuclear reactors in Japan, 
for more unfortunate reasons. But it turns out that uh, the reason you can do this experiment uh, to zero to order is uh, uh, because Japan has an interesting geography for doing neutrino experiments of this type. And what happens is they get a lot of energy from nuclear reactors. These tend to be close to the ocean because they need the water for cooling and things like that. Now Japan is an island. That means if you put your detector in the middle of the country, you basically get the same flux from all of these different reactors. And it turns out that somehow nature was uh, um, wise enough to also make the baselines of about 100 kilometers or so, which is perfect for doing this experiment. So this is the experiment that they did. They measured this flux of neutrinos coming from nuclear reactors with a baseline of about 100 kilometers or so. And here they make a plot as a function of some effective L over E of the uh, expected number of neutrinos that they get divided by, I'm sorry, the number of uh, events that they get divided by what you expect. And you see this really pretty oscillation pattern that looks here. So you see that the data really looks like an oscillation. They don't actually get to get two oscillations because they run out of L over E, but the blue line is what you expect from our neutrino oscillations. It doesn't look like a perfect sine wave because you have uh, averaging out effects. You don't really measure this as a function of L over E. You have to integrate over different Ls, and you also inter integrate over different Es, which have to do with energy resolution. But you get this really beautiful result that looks like an oscillation. It doesn't look like these other functions that have to do, say, with neutrino decay. And again, this one really is explained by the simple expression that Boris told you about. And what's very impressive is that the same delta m squared that explains the, the behavior of electron neutrinos coming from the sun, and the same kind of mixing angle, you know, this a third that I told you about, fits these data really well. So this is this picture here on the left and on the right is a summary of all the data that I showed you very quickly. The picture on the left says that if you look at neutrinos from the sun and you want to explain those data and you pretend that there are only two neutrinos out there, these are the parameters that you need and you get this, uh, this allowed region over here. And then you do this Camlin experiment and again, they also can be explained by neutrino oscillations and the allowed region looks like this uh, peanut shaped thing here. And uh, what's really impressive is that those two regions of the parameter space overlap. Okay, so the fact that this thing here done with solar neutrinos and this experiment here done with atmospheric, with uh, uh, reactor neutrinos, these two allowed regions of the parameter space overlap. And uh, this is probably the, one of the best pictures we have for convincing people that we really understand what's going on. Okay, these are very, very different phenomena with completely different sources, completely different detectors, and the same parameters where they have to do with neutrino oscillations fit these data perfectly well. So we know we have to be living here, and more importantly, we know that these oscillations are going on. We can't have any other phenomenon that would fit all of these data which are very different at the same time. Again, the atmospheric neutrinos and these experiments from NINOS, for example, they also can be explained with two flavor oscillations. And, uh, they also overlap somewhere that has a delta m squared around 10 to the minus 3 and a mixing angle that's about a half. Again, the picture is what's going on here is oscillations between new mu's and new tau's. And the picture of what's going on here is you have oscillations between new e's and something that's a combination of new mu and new tau. And both of these fits are done assuming that there are only two neutrinos. Of course, there are three neutrinos, but let me just summarize what the situation is again. So we have the solar data, new E to new active, with a delta M squared of about 10 to the minus 4, and a mixing angle that has sine squared of about a third. These numbers, by the way, are all easy to remember, which is kind of nice. Then you have the atmospheric neutrinos. It's mostly new mu to new tau, with a delta M squared of 10 to the minus 3, and a mixing angle of about a half. We have a third type of oscillation that I'll tell you about in just a second, which is a thing that's written in yellow here that you can't read on purpose. And again, we do have three neutrinos. Boris told you this picture. And this is the picture. We have new e, new mu, and new tau, new one, new two, and new three, some mixing matrix that's parameterized by three mixing angles, one CP odd phase that you might be able to see in neutrino oscillations, and potentially two other phases that are really hard to see. We're not going to talk about those. 
Now, there's a detail that I want to tell you about. So we have mu1, mu2, and mu3. They have masses m1, m2, and m3. They are the so-called neutrino mass eigenstates. Now, before we can move on, I have to tell you what these eigenstates are, just like I have to tell you what an electron neutrino is. Right? The electron neutrino is whatever it is that couples to the W boson and the electron. And the muon neutrino is whatever couples to the W boson and the muon. So for the neutrinos with a well-defined mass, I also have to tell you who they are. Okay, that means I have to tell you what their masses are. And the way that we pick those masses is a kind of peculiar way. So I'll tell you in a little bit of detail. So again, the masses are m1, m2, and m3. And we choose m1 squared to be less than m2 squared. Okay, so by definition, m1 is the state that's lighter than m2. Of course, I have m3, so how does that guy fit in? m3, it turns out, is such that the absolute value of m3 squared minus m1 squared or m3 squared minus m2 squared is bigger than m2 squared minus m1 squared, which is a positive number. Okay? That means that m3 is either much heavier than 1 and 2 or it's much lighter than 1 and 2 in such a way that this inequality here is satisfied. What this means is with this choice of uh, what m1, m2, and m3 are, uh, it turns out that the sine, plus or minus sine of delta m squared 1, 3 is a physical observable. Okay? And it's related to the mass hierarchy that Paul told you about. If delta m squared 1, 3 is bigger than 0, we have a normal hierarchy. And if delta m squared 1, 3 is less than 0, we have an inverted hierarchy. Okay? And we'll, um, I'll show you a, a picture of this in just a second. So how do we fit all the data? So first of all, we can do it really well. That's the first answer to how. And so this is a table that you also can't read from the back. Uh, but the really important thing that you want to keep in mind is that we have measured all of these mixing angles that parameterize this matrix uh, with precisions that are better than the 10% level. Except, curiously enough, for the atmospheric mixing angle, which is hard to measure at with very good precision, not because we don't have good data, but just because we measure sine squared of 2 theta. And you can try to ask, how does, what's the induced error bar between sine squared of 2 theta to sine squared theta when, theta, when sine squared of 2 theta is close to 1, and the error bar tends to blow up because of our, our, a, a Jacobian that comes about. But anyway, so we've measured these neutrino oscillation parameters really well, with better than 10% uncertainty. And, uh, this does not stop to, to amaze me every time I look at this table, because I remember, and I'm getting old enough that I can say stuff like that, uh, when I was a beginning graduate student, these parameters didn't exist. Okay? We couldn't measure them because they didn't exist. So we only found out that they existed in 1998, and you know, here we are 15 years later, and we actually can measure them uh, uh, with better than 10% accuracy. Now, there's an interesting thing that comes about from this picture, which has to do with theta 1, 3 that Paul has told you about. So remember, if you look at these results here, we have two oscillation frequencies, these two delta m squares, that we can explain with those two mass square differences that we can define with three neutrinos. And if you notice, we have seen the electron neutrinos oscillate with one frequency, and we've seen the muon neutrinos oscillate with the other frequency. We can make a prediction if this picture here is correct. And the prediction is that the electron neutrinos should also oscillate in the fast frequency. After all, there's nothing that prevents them from doing that. And uh, we can then set up an experiment to look for that. And that's what we did. So we set up what's called a, a, a series of different experiments. Uh, more importantly are these uh, reactor neutrino experiments, which are not the same as the Kamlin experiment, because now they have a very short baseline, about one kilometer which, by the way, is different from what Boris was telling you about, which was a reactor neutrino experiments with a baseline of 10 meters. So this is neither really short nor really long. It's about one kilometer. We pick one kilometer because we know the delta m squared. So we know that if this picture here is correct, that the electron neutrinos also should oscillate at that frequency. So we can pick the frequency here, 
And the only thing we don't know is what the amplitude is. The amplitude is given by this theta 1, 3. So if you make the right experiment, and if you get a little bit lucky, meaning if the amplitude is not zero, you should be able to observe this. And that's what these experiments did uh, about uh, 10 months ago or so. That's when the, the data from the Diabe experiment came out. And what they do is they have this uh, reactor in China, and they built a bunch of detectors. And they put a whole bunch of these detectors nearby to the reactor core. So this is the baseline. This is about, I don't know, 400 meters or so. So you have two detectors that sit over here. And then you put a bunch of other detectors further away at, say, 1.7 kilometers. The reason you have all these different detectors is that this is a disappearance experiment. Disappearance experiments means you, you, you want to know how many neutrinos you have to begin with, and you want to measure them at the end, and you want to see if the two numbers agree. Now, because we have neutrinos coming from a nuclear reactor, we're not really good at predicting how many are supposed to be coming out. So what we do is, effectively, we measure the flux in these annual detectors, and then we measure the flux in these fire detectors, and we expect those two numbers to be the same, regardless of how much we understand about the neutrinos coming from the nuclear reactor. Because we at least understand how the neutrinos propagate. So if those two numbers are different, it means that the neutrinos are oscillating between here and there. Another question is, why do you have so many detectors? The reason is that you want to make sure for this analysis to be a good analysis, that you really have the same detector in both near and far. Because if the detectors were different, uh, maybe this discrepancy could be due to the fact that you have different detectors. So you try to make your detectors as, as like one another as possible. And their solution is to build these detectors to be exactly the same. That, by the way, is why the error bars are different. Uh, because these ones get more neutrinos than those. But anyway, so you have several of those. You make a measurement. This red line is what you expect from neutrino oscillations. And again, the frequency was determined by completely different experiments. The amplitude is what you're fitting for. And then when they fit for this amplitude, which is sine squared of 2 theta 1, 3, they get the sky squared, which is not at 0. And you have a sine squared of 2 theta 1, 3, which is about 0.08, as Boris told you about. And by now, we have more than 5 sigma evidence that it's not 0. This is something that these experiments were built for. So again, this is how we know theta 1, 3. We actually have measured it really well. And it's, uh, it really speaks to the fact that we really understand this phenomenon really well. OK, what I mean by that is we have a picture. We have measured a bunch of stuff in that picture. This allows us to make a prediction for another measurement you should be able to make. And we've gone out and made a measurement, and it works. OK? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question, yeah. So Kamen can't measure this because this is a small effect. And uh, that means you need a lot of flux and very small systematic errors. Kamen had a baseline of about uh, 100 kilometers. And they had a really big flux from lots of different places. Uh, but they're not very good at their error bars. So this is, a, this is about a 10% effect. And uh, the effect that was measured at Kamen is about a 30% effect. So they can see the 30% effect really well. So if you look at this picture here. And uh, you also can see this uh, distortion of the spectrum very well. At 100 kilometers, the effect that I'm talking about here is uh, flat, first of all, because it has a very, it's a very quick oscillation that averages out. And the overall effect is to take this whole flux and maybe lower it by 5% or 4%. They're not sensitive to that. That's not something they can see. OK, so it's a combination of the fact that the oscillations have averaged out, so you don't have any shape information, and the fact that the overall, result is, the overall effect is very small. So if you, if you shift their flux from 100% to 96% or 94%, they can't tell. OK, so that's, the, that's why we know neutrinos have mass. So what is it we don't know? And I'll go through this very quickly, because Boris did show you these pictures. So, this is the normal hierarchy. This is the inverted hierarchy. Uh, these colors are supposed to represent the different entries in the mixing matrix. So for example, the, if you look at neutrino number one over here, it has some red, some green, and some blue. And uh, the fraction of this bar that's red is uh, UE1 squared. It's the probability that a neutrino number one will be measured as an electron neutrino when it hits something. 
Okay? So we have these two different pictures, and here's a list of what we don't know. Okay? We don't know whether CP, and CP violation is violated in neutrino oscillations or not. That's not something we've been able to measure. And in terms of the language that I was telling you about before, that has to do with this CP violating phase delta. Another curious question is if you look at neutrino number three, which is this guy here, you will appreciate the fact that it seems to have the same amount of green as blue. Okay, and as far as the data are concerned, these numbers are approximately the same, and they could be exactly the same. So it would be nice if we could figure out if these numbers are exactly the same, if one is a little bit bigger than the other, or the other way around. So we need more precise data in order to solve this question here. The other thing we don't know is we don't know whether the picture is supposed to be drawn this way, or whether the picture is supposed to be drawn that way. That's another thing we don't know. Everything else we do know, and what it means is, we can construct or we can imagine neutrino. Now, one thing which I need to mention is uh, the goal of these experiments is not really just to measure stuff that we haven't measured yet. Uh, we have to do something else first. And what we really would like to do first is to make sure that this picture is correct. And as Boris was telling you about, it's possible that this picture is not correct. And then there's more stuff going on. Now, I'd like to show this picture that we saw yesterday. It's a very nice picture. And uh, this is sort of what we did in the quark sector. We had a very similar picture. It's a three by three unitary mixing matrix. We measured all of the parameters. And then we measured them again. And then we measured them again. And then we measured them in 30 different ways. Why were we doing that? We weren't sure of the first results. No, we wanted to make sure that the picture was right. And as we heard yesterday, the picture is unfortunately right with some anomalies which are kind of small and so on and so forth. But the picture works really well. So what we need to do is we need to build a picture like this in the neutrino sector. That's the only way of convincing ourselves that that picture is actually right. And we're really far away from doing that. So let me go back to this matrix here that Boris did tell you about. And uh, remember I told you that those mixing angles and parameters have been measured at better than the 10% level. However, they're only measured at that level of precision because we assume that the model is right. For we assume, for example, that this matrix is unitary, for example. So you can ask yourself, what have we really measured? And basically, what we really measured is, uh, we measured this number here squared. We measured uh, maybe some combinations of the sums of these two numbers squared. This is from solar neutrinos. We measure this number squared times this number squared. We measure that number squared. And then we measure this uh, U mu 3 squared as well. So we've only measured the squares of some of the entries in this matrix here. Everything else comes from assuming that the matrix is unitary. So we still have a really long way to go. I mean, we haven't measured anything that is not just uh, the square of, of some, one of these numbers, for example. OK? So that's something to keep in mind is that the neutrino program going forward should not only measure the things that we haven't measured yet, but it should make sure that it can measure the same parameters in different ways through different combinations of these entries in this matrix just so we can start convincing ourselves that this picture is actually correct. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about CP violation because Boris told you about that. This is one thing that's often advertised and uh, I'm going to skip this because Boris has already said everything that's here. The second thing that we don't know, and uh, this is something which we can't address with neutrino oscillations, is we only measure the neutrino masses squared. Actually, the differences of, the, of, differences of neutrino masses squared. So we don't know what the masses themselves are because we only measure differences. So in particular, if you take the spectrum here of masses squared and you shift all of the masses squared by a constant, the neutrino oscillation data is the same. Another way of asking this question is, we don't know what the mass of the lightest neutrino state is. If we knew that one, we could combine it with the m squares, that we, with the delta m squares that we've measured, and then we could solve for all the other ones. Now, I do want to point out that this is a non-trivial but physical question. You know, whether the neutrinos weigh 0.1 electron volts or 20 electron volts is a different universe. Okay, the physics is very different. So the question is, how do we answer this question, which is what's the value of the neutrino masses themselves, not just the delta m squares? 
And again, we don't know how to measure this with neutrino oscillations. It's not possible. The best way to do this in the laboratory is to look for kinematical effect of the neutrino mass. After all, uh, producing a massive particle and producing a massless particle is kinematically distinct. So the way that we look for this is we study a beta decay. Okay? And in particular, we like to study beta decay processes that have a small Q value because the effect of the neutrino mass is as big as possible. So we look for tritium beta decay. Tritium is also something you have access to in large quantities, large enough quantities. And a tritium decays this way, and it decays into an electron and a neutrino. Now, this idea is actually very old, but I'll just tell you what it is. The idea is you can't look at the neutrino because the neutrino is really hard to detect, but you can look at the beta ray, the electron that comes out of this beta decay, and you can actually measure its energy. And then you can ask the following question. What's the largest possible energy that the electron can have that comes out of beta decay? It's a calculable quantity, and it depends on the neutrino mass. Because if you have to produce a neutrino mass, the largest possible energy that the electron can have is not as much as if the neutrino mass had been zero. Because you didn't have to spend any energy to produce a non-zero neutrino mass. Uh, I do want to point out, of course, that in this reaction here, we normally say that an electron antineutrino gets produced. But as we've just learned from Boris's talk, uh, the electron antineutrino doesn't have a well-defined mass. It is a linear combination of neutrinos with a well-defined mass. So what you measure is not the electron antineutrino mass, because that doesn't exist, but you measure, uh, if you want, a, an effective mass which turns out to be a linear combination of the light neutrino masses. And this comes about because neutrino masses are very small, so the, the combined result of all of the neutrino mass eigenstates being produced is that you're sensitive to something that is a linear combination of the neutrino masses squared, which unfortunately we like to call the electron neutrino mass squared. But I do want to emphasize that the electron neutrino doesn't have a mass. Actually, I do want to point out that the electron neutrino is not even a particle. It doesn't exist. Okay, things that don't have a well-defined mass don't exist. Neutrino number one, two, and three exist. And then there's a linear combination of them that talks to the electron via weak interactions, which we call the electron neutrino. But it's not a real particle. Okay? But nonetheless, there's this observable here, and then we can try to measure this by measuring beta decay really well. How do we do this in practice? The way we do it in practice is this is a centurion beta decay spectrum looks like this. This is the energy spectrum of the electron that comes out. And the way you want to measure this is you want to concentrate on the bottom part of this. And this is an arbitrary units. And this here is supposed to contain, uh, I forget if the number is here or not. Oh, it contains a, a, a part in 10 to the 13 of all of the beta decays that you have available. That means if you want to measure this, you have to be sensitive to a part in 10 to the 13 of all of your beta decays. That means you need a lot of them. A lot, you know, lots and lots of beta decays. And what you measure, it turns out, if you're a theorist like me, you'll be surprised to know that it doesn't matter. I mean, you don't actually get to measure where the, end, where the spectrum ends because that doesn't work. Okay, you can't measure how the spect where the spectrum ends that precisely. Or if you could, you would be basically determining the Q value of the reaction which is sort of a cyclic argument, and you can't get any information out of that. What you do measure is the shape of the spectrum at the endpoint. That's the, that's the observable. So what these guys measure is they, they're supposed to be able to tell whether the spectrum ends like this blue line, if the neutrino mass is about one electron volts, or whether it ends like this red line, which has a different shape towards the end, if the neutrino mass is zero. That's what the experiment is all about. So you have to collect all of the electrons that come out at the end, and then you want to look at the spectrum. So you want, to, you want to make a spectral measurement. Actually, they don't measure the spectrum. They make an integrated measurement. They integrate uh, you know, this little piece of the spectrum, and this little piece of the spectrum, and this little piece of the spectrum, and they use that information to reconstruct what the spectrum looks like. Now, this is the goal of the Katrin experiment. I'm not going to tell you anything about it, the Katrin experiment, except that they have a sensitive sensitivity to this electron neutrino mass, which is about 
0.2 electron volts. The other thing I want to tell you about is that this is a really big experiment. So this is a very famous picture of the spectrometer. The idea is you have beta decay that's happening. You take the, the, the beta rays that have come out, and then you make them go through this machine here, which has a, a voltage capacitor in it, and you can separate out whether the energy is less than something or bigger than something. And then you count how many beta rays you get. Now you have to do this in such a way that you don't lose any of your beta rays. And that's why you have to build something that is kind of big. So this is how what your spectrometer is. And I do want to point out lots of things. This is an experiment in Germany. And uh, this is a house. And uh, there are lots of reasons for you to believe that this experiment actually is in Germany. One is that there's a bunch of people here. So if this experiment were in the United States, and that uh, this was being dragged along some town in the United States, they would probably have evacuated the whole town three days before the spectrometer was supposed to go through. So you know this is not in the United States. And you know it's not in, I don't know, in Brazil, for example, because if this were in Brazil, everybody would be going towards the detector to try to touch it for no good reason, because that's what people there do. <laughs> Germans somehow are not tempted by stuff like that. Okay, and then the other evidence that we have for neutrino masses, uh, or bounds that we have from neutrino masses, Boris has touched on, they come from cosmology. And again, uh, Boris has already said this, I'll just say it very briefly. The idea is that we believe from the hot big bang scenario that there are a bunch of relic neutrinos around. Okay, we haven't been able to see any of them, but we have a lot of evidence that they're there. Actually, according to what Paul said, we even have evidence that there's, they're there a lot more than we thought that they were by a factor of 30% or so. So we know that they're around, and what happens is, if they have a non-zero mass, they are part of the dark matter. And uh, that's interesting because we know that dark matter exists. However, the neutrinos happen to be the wrong kind of dark matter. So if their masses get to be bigger and bigger, we have, you have more and more of the dark matter being of the wrong kind, meaning that it's ruled out by experiment, that sets an upper bound on the sum of the neutrino masses. So the dark matter related data that we have, it's just a large scale structure measurements, they really don't like what's called the hot dark matter. So the fraction of hot dark matter has to be less than something, that sets an upper bound on what the neutrino masses are supposed to be. And the upper bound is around one electron volt or so on the sum of all of the neutrino masses. If you look at all the data and you analyze it in different ways, you can get this bound to be about, say, 0.3 electron volts or so. It's kind of an analysis-dependent bound that depends on how much data you include in your fit and what assumptions you make about the rest of cosmology. I do want to show you a table that's probably not possible to read, but this is a list of future cosmological uh, missions that will be measuring stuff that will tell us about the neutrino masses. And the only thing I want to tell you is if you look at, well, you can't look at it, so I'll read you these numbers. These are the bounds on, or the sensitivity on the sum of the neutrino masses. And the numbers are starting to go below 0.1 electron volts. And there are even some numbers that go uh, well below 0.1 electron volts, like uh, there's 0.05 number here, there's a 0.006 number that comes about from some very ambitious study of the 21 centimeter line. Uh, and what's exciting is if you remember the other numbers that I told you about, the largest neutrino mass square difference that we're sure of is about three times 10 to minus uh, three electron volts squared. If you take the square root of that, it turns out that we know that at least one neutrino has to weigh more than 0 0.05 electron volts. That means if you have an experiment that's sensitive to the sum of the neutrino masses that adds up to 0.05 electron volts, you have to see them. You don't set a bound anymore, you actually have to see them. And if you actually get to set a bound, that means you learn something interesting. So we're looking forward to uh, uh, next and next, next generation experiments that have to do with uh, uh, measuring the sums of the neutrino masses. They should start to see something. Right now they don't see anything, but they should start. I'm sorry? Uh, the answer is, of course, no, but many of them are. Uh, and again, uh, I should say that none of these experiments are designed to look for neutrino masses. They measure properties of the, of the universe at large scales. So these are either galaxy surveys, they're studies of uh, microlensing and different lensing phenomena, and they all give you information about 
how the universe is expanding, which also gives you information on what the universe is made of. I'm sorry? Oh, and Planck, of course, yeah, so the CMB measurements, for example. I'm sorry? Oh, these are all, current limits really means current. These are the limits that we have right now. And uh, that's, that's the level that we're at. And uh, Planck is included here, by the way. And uh, Planck is supposed to push this bound on the sum of the masses by about a factor of two or so. It will do a better job on the number of neutrino species, but as far as the sum of the masses is concerned, it doesn't add very much. Because CMB by itself doesn't constrain the sum of the neutrino masses very well. It needs to be combined with more data. I'm so Oh, that has to do with uh, uh, how well these experiments will perform. They have lots of challenges like uh, foregrounds. You have to get rid of you know, useless stuff like stars and galaxies and so on. You just want to measure something different. And uh, they also have to do with uh, what kind of an analysis you're doing, what kind of assumptions you're making about uh, the rest of the cosmological parameters and so on. All right. So now let's, let me get to what I actually wanted to talk about. So this is the picture that we have. And again, uh, uh, we also saw this picture yesterday. This is a subset of that picture. And uh, what we've really learned is that neutrino masses are not zero. But we've also learned that neutrino masses are very small. Okay? Now, very small doesn't mean anything. So this picture is supposed to tell you what very small means. So again, this is a plot of all fermion masses in the standard model. And uh, as you already know, this plot has to be made in a log scale. Otherwise, you only see the top quark, and maybe the bottom quark there at the bottom. So you have to do it in a log scale. And as uh, uh, Marina mentioned this, uh, I think, yesterday, if you want to fit all of the charged fermion masses in the same plot, you need something like a five or six orders of magnitude. Okay? And that's already a very annoying feature of the standard model that we don't understand at all, is that these charged fermion masses are incredibly hierarchical. So they span about six orders of magnitude. Now, if you thought that was a bad enough problem, once you include neutrino masses, you actually need something like uh, 16 orders of magnitude to fit all of the fundamental fermion masses in the same picture. And one thing which I always like to mention to uh, younger people, because older people are, are too old, but this should be a very disturbing thought. Okay, and this is something that really makes particle physics uh, uh, interesting. Is that we have, you know, if you go out on the street and you tell people, oh, we have a bunch of fundamental particles, and their masses span 16 orders of magnitude. Okay, these two statements make absolutely no sense, right? How can the top quark weigh, you know, 10 to 15 times more than the neutrino, but nonetheless, they're all fundamental particles? We don't know, we have some answers, but it's very strange. So I want to con convey that information. And of course, the, uh, the other thing that makes this picture also more interesting is the fact that if you look at the charged fermions, even though they're also very hierarchical, for some reason, they tend to cluster together, at least if you look at it from this uh, uh, focus point. And the other thing that's interesting is even though they're very hierarchical, every order of magnitude or so, there's some new charged fermion that you can talk about. So if you start out with the electron, you go up by about a factor of 10 or 100. Uh, or actually, by, by, by about a factor of 10, you start running into the light quarks. You go up by another factor of 10. Here you have the muon and the strange. You go up by another factor of 10, you run into the tau and the charm. And then you go up by a factor of 3 or 4, you have the bottom quark. And the top quark is the outlier that's a factor of 30 away or so. Well, more like 50 away. Well, the, the bottom quark mass is kind of a messy question to ask. But anyway, so but you notice that these guys are very hierarchical. The neutrino masses live down here, and they're very small. But on top of that, there's this really big gap where apparently there are no other fermions that we know about, which is kind of interesting. And uh, so this is the picture. And our job, or if you're a theorist, or if you're me, my job is to try to figure out what does this picture mean? And I do want to make it very clear that this is all we know. We don't know any more than that. That's what we have to go with. So if you want to write down a neutrino theory model, that's pretty much what we know. Okay, so that's what we're, we're trying to explain.
Did somebody have a question or? Okay. The other thing that, that we also heard yesterday is the fact that uh, the lepton mixing matrix and the CKM mixing matrixes are very, mixing matrix, are, these are two very different matrices. Their sizes are very, very different. Okay. This is also something people try to explain and uh, I might touch on that at the very end of the talk, depending on how much time I'll have. Okay, so who cares about the fact that neutrino masses are not zero and very small? I do have to point this out, and already people alluded to this yesterday. Uh, the standard model is a very good model, okay? We have been able to measure tens of thousands of, of, of observables, and the standard model can explain all of them. The standard model, however, in the form that you learned in, say, Peskin and Schroeder, actually makes a prediction. And one of those predictions, actually makes many predictions, one of the predictions that it makes is that neutrino masses are zero. Okay? This is a very robust prediction. It does not get corrected by quantum corrections. It is true to all orders in perturbation theory. The standard model predicts neutrino masses to be exactly zero. Now, we know that that's not true. So it turns out that we've discovered something that the standard model predicted wrong. It wasn't very wrong. I mean, the masses are really small, but it's wrong. Okay? Now, why is this important? We have very, very few things that the standard model doesn't know how to explain. And the list is only getting shorter. Okay? So the list is so small that I can fit it into a footnote, which is this one here. So this is what the standard model doesn't explain, okay? One thing it didn't explain, or we didn't know if the answer was correct or not, had to do with the way that electric symmetry was broken. Now the standard model talked about this as Higgs mechanism, and that picture wasn't confirmed until uh, a few months ago. Now we're pretty sure that either the standard model answer for electric symmetry breaking is correct, or it's at least approximately correct. Uh, that's what this here means. So we can cross this out of the list almost, and maybe there's a lot of stuff going on here, but maybe not. The other thing that the standard model doesn't explain is dark matter. So we have pretty strong evidence that dark matter exists, and we also don't know what dark matter is, but we're very sure of what dark matter is not. Okay, dark matter is not something in the standard model. We have tried. So you take any particle in the standard model, you can ask, is this the dark matter? The answer is no. Neutrinos were good candidates. They turn out to be not the dark matter because they're too light and they're the wrong kind of dark matter. Uh, protons were also a good candidate for the dark matter. Actually, if there were no dark matter, it would all be baryons, but baryons are also not the dark matter. So whatever the dark matter is, it's not in the standard model. It's something new. Finally, the last thing that the standard model or, or that physicists in general did not expect was that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Okay? This is a measurement that came out uh, in the end of the 20th century, and it was a big surprise to everybody, certainly to me, but to most people that you ask. And we have absolutely no idea why that's happening. We do know that if it is a fundamental physics phenomenon, the standard model is completely uh, 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 dumb as far as addressing that question is concerned. Another way of putting it, there's a very naive estimate you can make for what is making the universe accelerate. And uh, when we try to calculate the rate, we get it wrong by about 120 orders of magnitude. So that means we're not asking the right question or we don't have the right model to ask that question. Okay, so this is a dark energy issue that's also not in the standard model either. But that's it, that this is everything that the standard model does not explain and neutrino masses. So that's why neutrino masses are interesting. That's a very good question. People always ask about that. That's the baryon asymmetry of the universe. It's the fact that the universe has more baryons than antibaryons by a lot. And uh, the, you can try to brush that aside as, a, as an initial conditions issue. Or it's something, it's a consequence of the history of the universe that has to do with initial conditions. This is getting very, very hard to do if you believe in inflation, which, by the way, is also not in the standard model. But if you believe in inflation, then 
explaining the baryon asymmetry of the universe can't be done by imposing initial conditions which are funny. It has to be done by some dynamical mechanism, which is also not in the standard model. If you don't believe in inflation, you might be able to get away with having boundary conditions. I, I don't like why questions. I only like describing things that we've observed that kind of questions. But you're correct. The standard model does not explain why it has the parameters it has, why you have three families, and all kinds of funny questions you can ask. These are very dangerous questions for a, for a physicist. We're not very good at answering why questions. We're very good at describing stuff and making predictions. You know, we don't know why alpha is 1 over 137. Maybe somebody knows, but I don't know. So the question is, how do we give neutrinos a mass? And the answer is, we don't know. Okay? And this is the, another important thing to keep in mind. Now, we don't know. It's not because we're not clever enough to know how to make, give neutrinos a mass. We're actually too clever. Okay? We can construct different kinds of ways of giving neutrinos a mass. And they all work. Because if they didn't work, they wouldn't have written the paper to begin with. So you have all these different models, and they all explain why neutrino masses are not zero. So the question is not that we don't know how to give neutrinos a mass. We don't know what's the right way of giving neutrinos a mass. So it's sort of an experimental question now, because we have all these different models, and we have to try to figure out which one is correct. Okay? I do want to say a word about electric symmetry breaking, because that's something that we talked about a lot, or you heard about yesterday a lot. Again, we've heard about this Higgs doublet and the Higgs mechanism, and that seems to be approximately correct. Now, we also know that the Higgs mechanism is what gives mass to all of the fundamental particles. And as we were reminded yesterday, it doesn't give mass to all particles because the proton mass has very little to do with the Higgs boson. Another thing that's fun to speculate is the fact that we don't know what dark matter is, but we have a feeling that the dark matter mass has very little to do with the Higgs boson, which means that all of the mass of the universe has very, very little to do with the Higgs boson as well. Although it could, we just don't know. And then, of course, there's the neutrino. So neutrinos get mass. So does their mass have anything to do with the Higgs boson? And the answer is we don't know. But the answer could be interesting. OK, so this is what I wrote down here. And uh, one thing that I want to remind people of is uh, whether neutrinos get a mass in the same way that all of the other particles in the standard model get a mass or not, they still have to get their masses from electric symmetry breaking. Okay? That means that their quantum numbers are such that they're not allowed to have masses before electric symmetry breaking. So they do have to get masses after electric symmetry breaking. Now, that doesn't mean they have to get masses like everybody else but they still have to be talking to this phenomenon of electric symmetry breaking. So here's a list of possibilities of how neutrinos get a mass having to do with the Higgs mechanism. The first one is that the neutrinos get a mass just like everybody else via some Yukawa coupling. Now, in order to explain why neutrino masses are very small, these Yukawa couplings have to be really small, like 10 to minus 12. Now, 10 minus 12 is fine. It's just a number. So maybe that's how neutrinos get a mass. And then if this is what's going on, by the way, the neutrinos are what are called Dirac fermions. We're, ge we're going to hear more about this after lunch. Another possibility is that neutrinos get a mass directly from the Higgs mechanism, but they actually get it from a different Higgs boson. So neutrinos might be evidence that there's another Higgs boson that lives out there, that also gets a vacuum expectation value, and somehow only gives a mass to neutrinos and the W and the Z. Okay, that's a logical possibility. And we don't know the answer to that either. The third possibility is uh, that there's another sort of mass out there, which has absolutely nothing to do with electric symmetry breaking. And the neutrino mass is a combination of the regular electric symmetry breaking mechanism and another source for mass that lives out there. And in that case, the neutrino would be the only particle that actually gets to talk to this other source of mass that we have out there. And again, another consequence of this is the fact that the neutrinos end up being Majorana fermions, and we'll hear about that after lunch. <coughs> 
Now, we would really, really like to find out which one of these pictures is correct. And we need experimental data in order to do that. Now, that data can come from all different kinds of places. They range from, say, nuclear decay experiments to the LHC, to searches for charged lepton flavor violation, and everything in between. And uh, that's why we pay attention to all different kinds of experiments in the neutrino physics. Let me give you one example of how neutrinos could get a mass. Okay? And that's the simplest example, and I'm only going to talk about this one. Now, one way to give the neutrinos a mass is to postulate that the standard model is not the whole picture of what's going on in fundamental physics. That's not a hard thing to postulate. We hear about that all the time. One way to parameterize how the standard model is an incomplete picture is to add to the standard model what are called higher dimensional operators. That means you allow for the standard model Lagrangian to include operators that are not renormalizable as well. Okay? The price you pay for that is that the standard model Lagrangian is no longer uh, applicable if you go to energy scales above some energy scale, some, some number. This is like uh, the, the, the Lagrangian that describes muon decay by a four fermion interaction. So that Lagrangian, which has muons, electrons, neutrinos, and this four fermion interaction, describes muon decay really well, with good precision, actually. It also describes a whole bunch of low energy phenomena really well. But if you try to explain, for example, uh, electron muon scattering at 100 GeV using the, the Fermi Lagrangian, you actually get an answer that doesn't make sense. Okay, so that Lagrangian has a region of validity that's governed by uh, the strength of the Fermi coupling. So we're doing the same thing here. We're starting to add to the standard model operators that are also not renormalizable. Okay? Curiously enough, you can do that in a systematic way by looking at the dimensionality of the coupling that sits outside of this higher dimensional operator. So that's how we classify the operators. And they have dimensions which are five and bigger. So you have dimension five operators, dimension six operators, dimension seven, eight, and so on. Now, it turns out that in the standard model, if you follow the particle content and the gauge invariance that we have in the theory, there's only one dimension five operator that you can write down, which is this one. It has two lepton doublets and two Higgs doublets. That's dimension five. So the coupling here has dimensions of one over energy, and we like to write that as one over lambda. Okay? And uh, if this coefficient goes like one over lambda, all of the other dimensional operators that I can write down would be one over lambda squared or higher powers of one over lambda. Now, we think that this Lagrangian is valid for energy scales which are well below lambda, which means that the most important effects of this Lagrangian are probably happening at the dimension 5 level or 6. And dimension 7 is really rare and so on and so forth. So somehow the dimension 5 operator might be the most important one. So let's say that you write this operator down, which is actually Weinberg did that in 1979. And uh, you postulate that this number lambda is a really big number, like much bigger than 1 TeV. And then you ask yourself, what is this operator good for? What does it do? Does it predict anything? And it only has one observable consequence. And again, uh, this is an analysis you could have done in, say, 1980, after you've understood Weinberg's paper. Maybe 1981, if you take a long time to read those papers. So if you take this operator here, and you look at it after electric symmetry breaking, this is what it contains. It contains a neutrino neutrino with some coefficient term, and this I call it Mij, and this Mij is given by Y, which is some dimensionless coupling, V squared, which is the Higgs dab squared, divided by lambda. So if you look at this operator and lambda is really large, this operator makes a prediction. It predicts uh, that neutrinos get Majorana masses. This is what this is. This is a neutrino Majorana mass. We'll hear about this after lunch in more detail. It makes a different prediction, which is if you stare at this, and this number lambda is much, much bigger than V, you also learn that neutrino masses are parametrically smaller than everybody else's mass. Okay? So here are two predictions that you've made, actually three. One is that neutrino masses are not zero, the neutrinos are Majorana fermions, and the neutrino masses are parametrically smaller than everybody else's mass. 
curiously enough, two of these three predictions have been verified because neutrino masses are not zero and neutrino masses are parametrically smaller than everybody else's mass. So the only thing that's missing is that the neutrinos have not been confirmed to be Majorana fermions yet. So by staring at this Lagrangian, we can ask more questions. Okay? And the other question we can ask is, when does this Lagrangian break down? That's a good question to ask because at the scale where the Lagrangian breaks down, that's where the new physics appears. Okay? And this is governed by this number lambda. Now, I only have y over lambda, so I can set the largest y to be 1, because this is sort of an arbitrary choice. So if I pick this to be 1, in order to explain all of the neutrino data, we need lambda to be about 10 to the 14 GeV, which is a very large number. Okay? So what this is telling me is that if this mechanism is correct, the standard model has to break down at an energy scale which is at most 10 to the 14 GeV, where I expect to find new particles. So this is a prediction that this scenario here makes. Now you can ask, does this make any other predictions? And the answer depends on how this operator comes about. That has to do with what's called the ultraviolet completion of this operator, which is uh, whatever makes physics at very low energies look like this operator, and we have to find out how it manifests itself when you do experiment at very high energies. Okay? So I want to mention one example of this, which is the one that everybody knows. Okay? And uh, so how do we generate that operator? Or how do we give neutrinos a mass in a different way, if you want to look, about, look at it that way? Um, the best way to do this, or the simplest way to do this, is to look at the standard model and ask yourself, why don't neutrinos have a mass? And the answer is actually very simple. The neutrinos are missing a partner. The standard model only has the left-handed neutrino fields, but it doesn't have any right-handed neutrino fields. So we can fix that by adding right-handed neutrino fields. So let's do that. And right-handed neutrino fields are actually interesting fields because if you look at a right-handed field that has the quantum numbers of the neutrinos after electroweak symmetry breaking, that field, uh, actually that's not completely true, but one version of that field uh, is a complete gate singlet. Okay, so we have to add to the Lagrangian a, a fermion that has no gauge quantum numbers at all. Okay, so that's what we're adding to the Lagrangian. For good measure, let's say that we add three of them. We don't have to add three, we could add just two is enough. Or we could add three or seven or 23, that would, that would be just fine. Okay, but let's add three just for argument's sake. And then we just write down what the Lagrangian is. Okay. That's one of the nice things about the standard model is once you know the gauge coupling, uh, the gauge interactions, and you know the particle content, you know what the Lagrangian is. Uniquely determined. Modulus some measurements you have to make, but that's a detail. So if we ask, if we add to the Lagrangian right-handed neutrino fields or gauge singlet fields, what's the most general Lagrangian that I can write down? Okay, and you add the standard model Lagrangian. Then you have these new fields. They have a kinetic energy term. So you add that. And then you said, what interactions can these guys have? And they can only have one kind of interaction. That's a Yukawa coupling type of interaction like this. Okay, so we add that. And then you go back and you ask, so what other interactions can you write down with a singlet field, with a gauge singlet field in your Lagrangian? And it turns out there's another thing you can write down, and that's what's called a Majorana mass. It's a new term you can add in your Lagrangian, which renders the right-handed neutrino fields massive by themselves. And this is a mass which has absolutely nothing to do with the Higgs mechanism. It's a new relevant operator in your Lagrangian. Okay? It's a brand new type of, of, of operator that does not exist in the standard model as we know it today. So this is a nice Lagrangian, and you can explore it a little bit more, and you find out quickly that after electroweak symmetry breaking, this Lagrangian tells you that instead of having three neutrinos, you actually have six. There are six objects that look like neutrinos, and they're all Majorana fermions, and in principle, they're all massive, which is great because this seems to be at least a halfway towards explaining all the data that we have. And if nothing else, it just works too well because now I have more neutrinos than I asked for. So the question is, if I take this Lagrangian, can I fit all the data? Okay, this seems to be a good way of doing physics, so let's do that. 
So if we look at the data, how do we explain this Lagrangian? Before we do that, we can ask ourselves, what do we know about this number m? Okay, this is a new mass scale in the Lagrangian. And uh, it turns out we know absolutely nothing about this number m. Okay, it's a new parameter. We have absolutely no idea what it is. We can make guesses. And that's what people do. And let's pretend that all of them are the same, okay? And people like to make guesses like, oh, you know, this new scale in the theory m is probably some very heavy scale. Let's say it's way heavier than the, the weak scale, for example. And in particular, we know about one of those scales, which is called the gut scale. So maybe that's a good guess for what this number m should be. If you don't like that guess, you can make your favorite guess. And there's no correct guess. They're all either guided by some phenomenon that we would like to explain or by some theoretical prejudice. If you turn the picture around and you ask, what is the data telling me about M? The answer is very little. Okay? This is what the data, oh, actually, do I, am I, no, I'm not missing a slide. This is what the data are telling me about this number M. Remember, the data is uh, this picture that I, showed, that I showed here before, that neutrino masses are not zero. And in a little bit more detail, what we know is that we know of at least the three neutrinos. And as far as we know, they're mostly made out of linear combinations of nu e, nu mu, and nu tau. That's it. These are the data. So how do we fit all of these data? Uh, one choice is to pick this number m, all of them, to be exactly zero. Okay? If I pick all of these numbers m to be exactly zero, you actually get to explain all of the data really well. In this scenario, the neutrinos are what are called Dirac fermions, okay? And their masses are given by Ruka coupling times the Higgs Vav. And in order to explain all the data, you have to make these lambdas less than about 10 to the minus 12 or so, okay? So that's one really good choice. And uh, this is a completely stable choice. And this is another comment that's important to make, is uh, if all the ends are zero, your Lagrangian has an enhanced symmetry. We heard about this yesterday. So if all the m's are zero, the standard model Lagrangian has a U1 B minus L global symmetry that's not anomalous. Okay? This is really exciting because it tells you that uh, any value for this number m that's not zero is natural in the Toft sense. So we like to say it's technically natural. That means that quantum corrections to this number m are proportional to itself. Okay? So this is not like the Higgs mass, which has these quadratic divergences, if you want. And it's very sensitive to new physics scales. This uh, Majorana neutrino masses for the right-handed neutrinos are not like that. If you set them to be, you know, 10 to the 7 GeV, quantum corrections to them keep them at 10 to the 7 GeV. If you want them to be 10 to the minus 20 GeV, quantum corrections to them keep them at 10 to the minus 20 GeV. So any value for M is a natural value. This is kind of sad because it means we don't have any guidance from theory as, as far as what that number should be. But that's what the situation that we live in. The other logical possibility is that this number m is much, much bigger than these are the rack masses for the neutrinos. Okay? In this case, what happens is your six neutrinos that I was talking about, they tend to decouple from one another three by three. So they, they, they form triplets. And then you have three pairs that are very light and three pairs that are very heavy. The, pair, the, the, the triplet that's very light is mostly made out of mu e, nu mu, and nu tau. And the, and the triplet that's very heavy is mostly made out of these right-handed neutrinos that don't have any gauge interactions. This scenario fits the data really well. In this scenario, the neutrino masses that we know about is given by mu squared divided by m, where mu is this, are these are Dirac masses. So again, and this is what's called the seesaw mechanism. It's a mechanism that explains why the neutrino masses are very small by predicting that there are more neutrinos out there that happen to be very heavy. Now, there's one really important message about this particular operator here, which is when is this operator valid? Okay? And the assumption that we're making is that M is much, much bigger than mu. Okay? So one value you can pick is if you pick mu to be, say, the top quark mass, which is 174 GeV, the value for m that you need to explain neutrino masses is like 10 to 14 GeV. That's one choice. Another choice I can make is if I pick mu to be 
0.1 electron volts, then I have to pick M to be one electron volt, and that explains the data really well as well. Okay, that's really important to keep in mind. Then there's another possibility which is actually ruled out. Okay, so if you pick the right-handed neutrino masses, capital M, and the direct neutrino masses to be all the same, that means that your six neutrino states all have about the same mass. That leads to a prediction that you have a bunch of sterile neutrinos that mix a lot, and uh, we don't have any evidence for that. So that's ruled out. Okay. And uh, do I want? To, I'm, I'm I'm going to run out of time, which is planned. So that's fine. But uh, uh, but let me st okay. Let me not talk about this. Let me do talk about. Uh, a different way of asking uh, the question about what are right-handed neutrino masses. I already told you that we don't have any technical reason to believe that they're anything, but there's some hints out there. One is you can actually come up with an upper bound for the right-handed neutrino masses. And the upper bound comes from the fact that you want your theory to be perturbative. So you want your Yukawa couplings to be less than 4 pi or so. So if you take that bound, the largest right-handed neutrino mass has to be below 10 to the 15 GeV or so. That's an interesting upper bound. People tend to get excited by this because this is very close to the gut scale. Okay? There's another upper bound which is very related to stuff that we heard about yesterday. Let's say that you believe in naturalness. And here we have a new physics scale in the model. It's the right-handed neutrino mass. That will destabilize the Higgs mass in the way that we heard about yesterday. So you can ask, so what mass should the right-handed neutrinos have such that you don't destabilize the Higgs mass? And the answer, curiously enough, is 10 to the 7 GeV. It's not 1 TeV, by the way. I have to mention that. So if the new physics scale is less than 10 to the 7 GeV, the Higgs mass does not get destabilized away from the weak scale. Why is that? That's because the neutrino Yukawa couplings can be very small. So that means you do have new physics that talks to the Higgs boson, but it happens to talk to it in a very weak way if these masses are less than 10 to the 7 GeV. That's an interesting number to keep in mind. And finally, uh, I do want to make a complaint about having these masses M be very large. Okay? So if the right-handed neutrino masses are way above the weak scale, it's a complete reasonable logical possibility that even has some nice features to it, it does have a really big downside. Is that this is a model that's completely untestable. Okay, if I tell you there's a new particle out there, and oh, by the way, it weighs 10 to the 10 GeV. Okay, this model is almost completely uh, un unfalsifiable. That doesn't make the model wrong. It just makes it impossible to test. And it might be that this is how nature works, but there are other possibilities out there as well. Okay, what I did want to talk about is, uh, and let me just make one choice here very quickly. I'm not going to talk about, so I'm, I'm just going to, so don't read any of this. This, you, this will be very fast, so there you go. You can ask later. I do want to leave you with this picture here before I make some comments about lepton mixing, and then I'll stop. So if you take the scenario that I was telling you about, so again, you take the Lagrangian, you add right-handed neutrinos to it, and then you ask, how do I fit the data? The important parameter is what's the value of the right-handed neutrino masses. If you take all of the data that we have available, the right-handed neutrino masses cannot be bigger than about 10 to the minus 9 electron volts. That gets ruled out by solar neutrino data, curiously enough. And they can't be less than about one electron volt, because that gets ruled out by, say, atmospheric neutrino data. So this region of the mass space here is ruled out by experiment. Okay? Anything below 10 to the minus 9 electron volts, including zero, is allowed. Okay? So that fits the data really well. In this region here, uh, you make some predictions. One of them is that the neutrinos as far as we can measure, behave like the rack fermions, for example. This region of the mass space doesn't go up until infinity. As I just told you, it stops at about 10 to the 15 GeV, which in electron volts is 10 to the 24. So that means that this plot goes on until about here or so. 
And that means that I have a model that fits all of the data that has a free parameter in it that I can't pinpoint with within, say, 24 orders of magnitude. Okay? And that's the situation that we're in. How are we going to do more, or how are we going to do better than that? The way we're going to do better than that is we probably need more data. Okay? And what's interesting is, in this region over here, for example, where the right-handed neutrino masses are about, say, 1 to 10 electron volts, you do have a prediction. And the prediction is that you must observe a light stereo neutrinos. It's a little bit more fun than that, I and mean, that's the stuff that I skipped. I have another prediction. I think I know what the mixing angles are. And it turns out that I can kind of fit the LS and D data that Boris was telling you about with this model. But forget about the LS and D data. What's really exciting is the fact that this is actually falsifiable. If you do do experiments that search for stereo neutrinos and you don't find any, you can take this boundary and you can push it a little bit, maybe this way. This is not a lot, but it's something. And what's interesting, all the way through here, there are types of experiments you can envision, sometimes which have very little to do with neutrinos, things like searching for meson decays or doing LHC-type experiments, where you can start to probe these neutrino mass models in this region over here where the model is actually testable. After I go above this point here or so, then the model is no longer testable. There's no experiment I can do on the Earth that can tell me if this idea is correct or not. This is the testability thing that I was going to talk about. The last thing, I just want to make one comment about mixing, and then I'll stop. I understand it because there's another talk, yeah. So the only point I want to make about mixing is uh, very, very brief. Is, uh, so these are the mixing matrices that we've learned about. And already uh, Marina told us that they're very different. One point I like to make all the time is if you stare at these matrices, we normally like to say that look how strange the lepton mixing matrix is, right? Because it has all these large mixing angles in them. I think it's important to keep in mind, in, uh, in hindsight, that the CKM mixing matrix is really strange. I mean, why would it look like that? Mixing matrices don't look like that. They look like this, I claim. Of course, we only have two, so you have to pick which is the one that you like. And I claim that this one is the simple one, and this one is the complicated one. And I'm going to skip what I was going to say as well, because I completely ran out of time. So let me just uh, conclude with so what are we going to do with neutrino physics in the future? I mean, we know very little about where neutrino masses come from, and that we have all these different possibilities that explain it, and they're all equally valid given the data that we have. So how do we learn more? We learn more in many different ways, which is one of the reasons why neutrino physics is such an interesting science, because it, it gets information from everywhere. You know, so we really like to do, for example, experiments with charged leptons like uh, looking for EDMs of charged leptons or looking for phenomena that violate flavor in the, lept in the charged lepton sector. And the reason is, of course, that neutrinos and charged leptons are related. The fact that they're related means that by learning about charged leptons, we're probably learning about where neutrino masses come from. Of course, there are searches for lepton number violation that we're going to hear about after lunch. And then, of course, there's a whole program of neutrino oscillation experiments which is the only guaranteed way we have of actually learning more about neutrino properties. Another thing I want to advertise, uh, which actually Boris mentioned in passing, is uh, neutrino interactions have not been measured particularly well. For example, there's a phenomenon called the neutrino uh, nucleon scattering, which is coherent, which we've never observed, which actually has a really big cross-section, by the way, for neutrino standards. So, Studying neutrino properties is very important because they might show up as having different interactions or new, say, weaker than weak interactions that only neutrinos get to see. And finally, the last thing is uh, what do neutrinos have to do with the LHC and all this exciting uh, uh, high energy physics that we hear about so much? And uh, the question you can ask yourself is, is it possible that we learn about where neutrino masses come from from the LHC? And the answer is, of course, yes, it's possible. There's no guarantee that it will happen. There's no theorem that says that the LHC, by the time it's done running at 10 TeV, will learn where neutrino masses come from. And of course, whether the answer is yes or no is not up to us to decide, but we actually get to do the experiment. Unfortunately, the LHC is happening. 
So we'll get to see what the answer for that is. Okay, and I'll stop here. Thanks. I think we have time for a few quick questions before we connect to. When you discussed the mass measurement in the Katrin experiment, okay, you didn't consider the possibility of sterile neutrinos. Now, maybe I misunderstood this, but wouldn't they mix in also? In Absolutely, that? yeah. So that, that, that's, a, that's part of the stuff that I skipped. But if you do have sterile neutrinos of the type that Boris was talking about, so, and again, one thing to keep in mind, when we say sterile neutrinos, we never get to see the sterileness of the neutrino. We only get to see more mass eigenstates that couple to the electron, the muon, and the tau. So if you do have more of those, they would contribute to the Catherine experiment as well. If they're very light, uh, of the type that we're talking about here, they only make this effective mass of the electron neutrino uh, larger. So they do get constrained by that. At some point, they get to be heavy enough that their effect on, on, on the Catherine experiment has a different nature. And the effect that it has in the Catherine experiment is uh, instead of uh, just changing the endpoint of the spectrum, it, it, it adds a kink to the spectrum. Because only for electron energies below something, you can actually produce the, these are heavy neutrinos. So people have done studies of that. The problem is that also depends on the mixing angle. So as the mixing angle gets smaller and smaller, the effect of these guys is smaller and smaller as well. But yeah, but there are bounds from, uh, from uh, Catherine-like experiments on sterile neutrinos, yeah. Let's stack this field. Mm -hmm. 